Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the latest in our Work Well Live webinar series. So it's our final webinar uh, today before we take a summer break. And the goal of these webinars, if it's your first one to join, it's to share ideas, information, advice that can support and promote healthy work environments for everybody. So the live webinars are just one part of the Work Well community. We also have uh, there's a Work Well podcast, we have articles, there's a private forum where you can ask questions. And we have an online education hub that's called the Work Well Institute. And that's for all your workplace well-being training and education needs. And as it turns out, just by pure coincidence, we actually have a program at the Institute for creating a team of well-being champions. And I'll give that a mention at the end of the session today for anyone that would like some, some more details on that program. I mean, another, one of the other courses we have actually is at the Institute is for well-being leaders. And that, that course is called Developing a Workplace Wellness Program That Lasts. And as it turns out, one of our guests today is a graduate of that course. So let me go ahead and introduce our guests for today. So oh, first we have Tony Nestor. So Tony is the Head of People Engagement, Customer Services at AIB. And one of Tony's key areas of responsibility is driving the well-being agenda for a diverse multi-location workforce of over 1,000 staff. Tony chairs the AIB Wellbeing Governance Council, who decide the areas of well-being that AIB focuses on. And Tony is responsible for ensuring that all of the, I think it's over 100 well-being advocates are fully aware of AIB's well-being initiatives. We also have uh, Suzanne French. And Suzanne is 21 years in AIB and in uh, varying roles across operations and HR. And she's currently a member of the group well-being team where she's responsible for coordinating and promoting group-wide well-being events. And that includes AIB's first virtual well-being festival for staff, which had over 80 events taking place. And that was just last month. So I'm sure we'll, we'll have a little bit of a chat about that during our session today. So Tony, Suzanne, welcome. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. It's it. Thanks, it's Oh, you're very, you're very welcome. No, look, I've been following kind of your progress and the work you're doing with the champion, with the advocate team at AIB. So I know it's, there's a lot of interest in kind of a shared ownership for well-being across organizations. And I, you know, I can't really see anyone doing it, doing it better than you guys. So it's thanks for giving up your time today, kind of to share what you've, the lessons learned, the successes, the challenges, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff today. So we really appreciate you taking the time today. Very welcome. So I'll, I'll kick off I'll one poll and then I'll hand over to you guys to, to take over for a while. So a very simple question. I'm just interested in, I know there's a lot of interest in the area of kind of well-being champions, but maybe for everyone that's tuning in live, let me know, do you have a well-being champion team at your organization already? And uh, maybe you do. Yes, obviously is the answer to that. Maybe you don't, but you're considering it. Or maybe, maybe you're self-employed. Maybe you're a very, very small team of two or three people. And so maybe it just isn't really... Uh, an option given your, your current role. So maybe just let me know in the poll there, we'll give it, let's give it a couple of seconds. And uh, in terms of our format today, so yeah, we'll, I think Suzanne and, and Tony, they've got one slide, but they're gonna just introduce, if you like, the wellbeing advocate team at AIB. And we'll, we'll have a bit of a discussion on that. And then we'll, we'll kind of go straight into Q&A. So get your questions ready. Q&A, use the, the Q&A functionality down below if you can. That's, the, those questions go straight to myself. Uh, and to, to Suzanne and Tony. So it might get lost in the chat, but put it in the Q&A, we should see it. Okay, so great. I've got the uh, results coming in here now, which is great. So thanks everyone for voting. So yeah, over 50% have a team and about 38% then are, are considering a team as well. So a nice mix there and about 10% are, are maybe just doesn't, doesn't suit whatever the structure of the team is. Okay, brilliant. Thanks everybody for, for sharing. Um, I think, Suzanne, maybe you're going to kick off, are you? You've got a bit of a, a, like a one slider to, to talk about the structure. Absolutely. So hopefully you should see the slide there now. That's perfect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, look, I suppose this is literally just to kind of give an overview to people of what the structure is within AIB. So um, we have a group wellbeing officer who was appointed in April of 2019, and he is part of the senior management team within the HR function, so reporting directly into the chief people officer. Um, then, as Brian mentioned, I'm a member of the group wellbeing team and um, reporting directly into the group wellbeing officer. As, to as Brian said, Tony chairs up the 
Wellbeing Governance Council, um, which is made up of representatives from all areas of the business. Um, and then we have, as you mentioned, over 100 advocates, wellbeing advocates that are dotted across the group and they support the wellbeing activities that we promote and arrange from a, a sort of a group level, I suppose. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, I've just included kind of some of our partners, I suppose, and some of the resources that we utilize as part of the, the wellbeing program. So Workplace Options provide our employee assistance program and have done for a number of years. So it's there's some fantastic resources that are available through their website. And obviously they provide access to counseling sessions and um, to kind of wellbeing coaching and things like that for staff. So again, and we kind of make sure that as part of the wellbeing program, we're promoting all of those offerings and making sure that the staff are aware of them. And um, we launched our Time to Talk program then internally, which is our ongoing mental health awareness program last October. And in April of this year, then we launched a keyword partnership with the crisis text line 50808. Um, and that was to kind of supplement, I suppose, the Time to Talk campaign. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more later, Brian. Um, and then also we have Pep Talk and Gym Pass who are two of our well-being partners. So um, we had been in talks with Pep Talk anyway, sort of at the start of last year. And then when COVID hit, we were able to sort of, I suppose, accelerate that partnership and get kicked that off, which was fantastic because it gave staff an opportunity to, I suppose, engage in a way that we hadn't previously been able to do via the Pep Talk app. Also gave access to, to loads of wellbeing resources and then Gym Pass as well as a partnership that we launched in May of last year. So giving access to physical gyms when they reopen um, and they've also, I suppose, upgraded, if you like, their virtual offerings as a result of COVID. So, you know, access to a number of different apps uh, lifestyle, nutrition, physical well-being, mental well-being, sleep, meditation, all of that sort of stuff. So um, like I say, the, the well-being program is really just about promoting all of those resources that we do have available to the advocates. And then when we have individual events on cascading them down via the council and the advocates so that uh, we get coverage across the group. And, and just for clarity, you're in ALB, the terminology you use, like I call them well-being champions, you, they're, they're well-being advocates. advocates. Yes. Advocates. The advocates are effectively the, the, the champions what we're talking about here, yeah. yeah and exactly. um, that structure is, is very clear to me. Um, can I just ask, is the group well-being officer, that's a full-time role, um, the well-being team, how many people are on, on the team? Uh, so we have seven people on the team and that includes, so we also have responsibility for diversity and inclusion and for engagement. Um, so there are seven people on that team and then as I said, Wellbeing Council, we probably have in the region 20 people on that town representing yeah. all areas of the business. Yeah, that's it, exactly. So our, our Wellbeing Council, is, as you said, Brian, really look after the governance with regard to what's decided, how the money is spent, um, where we really need to focus and very much kind of planning for the future as well. Um, and those people, they are, I suppose, volunteers are uh, very much so um, people who are um, key advocates of wellbeing and really feel or understand the importance of wellbeing across the organisation. But these people and myself included, we are um, actually in the business rather than being yeah. part of HR, um, which we feel is, is a really important part because uh, what we've seen, and we can talk a little bit later with regards to the advocates around this as well, is, is that um, when, when people have personal responsibility or when they feel a sense of ownership for something, that is really when we can see that things are driven. Um, and uh, we see that not only across the, the council, but also across the advocate group. Um, and um, if we look at the advocate group, it's kind of grown a little bit since we probably last spoke. We've kind of close to maybe 200 advocates yeah. across our across the organization now. And we're really proud. They're an amazing group of people. And I know there's a lot, there's a few of them on here uh, today. So we'll be hi to everybody and thanks. Um, and these are a group of people who, um, I suppose, as Suzanne said, I would have initially kind of known a number of them and a number of the guys would have worked directly with me. Um, and they're a community of people who, prior to the setup of the, the, the well-being um, team within AIB, they would have driven well-being within their own specific areas. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what we were being able to do is leverage off 
their commitment and their passion to well-being and created this really, really strong community right across the organization. Um, and I suppose it's it's not just here in the Republic, I suppose it's it's also in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, in the UK and also in the US. And we're very, very conscious of the fact that we want the everybody across AIB to have the same experience around well-being. Um, and before the, the well-being um, uh, officer was appointed and the team created, um, there were pockets, as I said, uh, where well-being was very, very strong. Um, and having now a central uh, responsibility, as it was uh, for well-being and driving out the key initiatives across AIB, we're now seeing that um, well-being is uh, being experienced uh, similarly in all of our locations, um, which is brilliant um, because we, I know myself personally, I've, I've really seen the benefit of uh, having a very strong well-being community in our own area over the last uh, five or six years. Um, and, and it's, it's been great to be involved in, in something like that. Um, and, you know, like I said, when we spoke to you last, uh, we had just over 100. Um, and through COVID, we saw people getting more involved and wanting to get more involved and seeing the benefit of being a, a well-being advocate. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that it, it's great to see kind of people putting their hand up, wanting to get involved and certainly driving uh, the well-being agenda across AIB. That, that's so important that you have so many kind of different voices, different locations, um, all represented on, on the advocate team. What, what, what might differ, I'd say, for, for a lot of companies, you know, given AIB's size, yeah. you, I mean, most organizations will not have you know, close to 100 or 200 mm -hmm. champions or advocates. Yeah. You know, almost what the, the, maybe some of the companies listening in, maybe close, a closer reflection for them might actually be the, the governance council, almost mm -hmm. like the steering committee. Yeah. That would, might be a little bit closer, if you like, or al aligned perhaps to size-wise anyway, mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to, to the champion teams they're possibly put, thinking of putting together. But the, the whole thing is supporting kind of a grassroots community, as you said, Correct. of people mm -hmm. that are kind of inputting into all your kind of decision-making, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Absolutely. And the council plays a really, really important part in that. Um, and Suzanne and the team would come to the council with ideas around what it is they would like to drive um, uh, across uh, across the organisation. Um, and there's a good bit of challenge and a good bit of discussion with regard to what it is uh, we feel will really land. Yeah. Um, and it's it's that discussion I think that that really leads to uh, the success of the program because we need to make sure that we're we are thinking of all elements of well-being and not just focusing on certain amounts so it's great to see that there there is that challenge and as we said there's, there's about 21 people on 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 that group mm -hmm. and it represents all areas so yep. kind of like their own little mini their little mini uh, well-being groups sure. um, as well that'd be your view as well Suzanne wouldn't it yeah, absolutely. And I suppose as well, Brian, we were talking just before, like we kind of kicked off earlier and I was saying to you, you know, I had started off as a well-being advocate. So I was working in the retail area of, okay. of the bank. Um, and, you know, when Tony was kind of reaching out to people and asking people, did they want to become part of this well-being advocate community? I was one of those people because of different initiatives that I had been involved in in the past in the well-being space for my own team. Mm. Um, and it was very much, you know, the initial ask was, do you want to come along and kind of see what this is about mm. and then decide if it's something that actually you want to do and to represent your area and like at the time it was absolutely something that I wanted to do but you know I was looking after a team of maybe uh, 20 30 people but I was part of a department with maybe 120 130 so I was like planning well-being events and activities yeah. for that smaller team but I was always interested in sort of what what we could do on a wider basis and how we could kind of join the dots. I was very conscious that, you know, as Tony said, some areas were really, really good at well-being, others not so much. But like, let's pool our resources. Like, let's, instead of me organising something for 120 people and maybe only 20 people turning up, let's kind of, you know, group yeah. together with other teams or other departments that were in the building mm -hmm. and let's do something on a bigger basis so that more people get to attend or to appreciate yeah. 
So, so even career progression opportunities there. So you're, you're working in retail, um, doing Absolutely. a little bit of well, become an advocate, a well-being advocate, and apply for the role, I guess, and get it now. And now you're kind of full-time in the group well-being side of things. Yeah. What about, there's a question in here, good question. What about the guys, so the advocates, in, let's say in the different parts of the business, how do you, let me just make sure I have the wording correct, how do you encourage them to get involved, I guess, in addition to their day job? Is, I guess the role is, is kind of clearly defined in advance yeah. so they know what's expected of them. Absolutely. And one of the things that we did towards the um, middle of last year and end of last year was we actually created um, an objective uh, for people who were becoming um, well-being advocates, which would be included as part of their performance review at the end of the year. So we would have very clear role, um, very very clear role and responsibility with regard to what's expected of the advocates. Um, and I, I must say, we have never had difficulty with regard to people putting their hands up. Uh, in fact, we one of the area one of the the, the things that we kind of worry about it is is that we've so many people that want to get involved how do we make sure that the, that that it, be, it it continues to be something that's that's driven by the, by the right people um and um it's it, it, it we, as I said, like we, we haven't had that that issue with regard to encouraging people to get involved um and even i suppose through the council what we've done is if we've identified pockets of areas across the organization where there may not be as many advocates as we would like yeah. through them we actually ask them to go and to go into their own individual areas and look and maybe reach out to people that they may know and this is where the local element of it comes in as well so you could have somebody who is really interested in well-being but at a central perspective we may never know that but at a local perspective they will and that's where they reach out to their contacts and that's how we, it has it has been a success so, so they're still they're volunteering but the mm -hmm. top of the shoulder, look, you might be interested in this. Would you yeah. be interested in, yeah, mm -hmm. in volunteering? Yeah. And I, I would just add to that as well, Brian, just to say that I suppose having that central well-being team to kind of coordinate initiatives has probably made things a little bit easier for advocates on the ground because we're now giving them content that they can share in their areas. They don't necessarily have to do all the work to organize the events. They're promoting events, encouraging people to attend. So it takes a little bit of the pressure off in some ways yeah. because they have all of this content that we're pointing them to instead of having to do all the research individually themselves. Sure, so I think you mentioned, I saw you mentioned previously there, the eyes and ears, they're yes. kind of uh, they're gathering information, feedback mm -hmm. of what maybe what's what people are looking for, but then that are also communicating your message, your initiatives out to the the local populations then as well. Exactly. And I think we have two really good examples, Suzanne, with regard to initiatives that our, our advocates have come up with, which we have taken from at a central side and run right throughout the organisation. So one would be our plan to Jan, which was uh, a, um, an initiative run by Linda Redmond down in, in uh, the southeast, I'll get it right, the southeast, um, all around, uh, you know, kind of focusing on your um, activity and on healthy eating at the beginning of the year um, and uh, we that that was was um, promoted out through our advocates and culminated in a virtual run uh, there was two virtual runs one I think the end of March and one the end uh, the middle of, of April uh, which was fantastic and it was great to see the, the, the interaction with regard to that and then I suppose the second one which is a really really big one for us was one an idea that would have been one of our council members um, Teresa Dooley came up with all around time to talk mm -hmm. um, and the importance I suppose of talking and um, uh, the, the, the whole part of, with regards to um, training that could be provided to our advocates uh, around um, dealing with people who want to talk and who may be struggling and um, identifying kind of if people were suffering kind of from some mental health problems. So I, I, lo I love hearing stories like that. I mean, that's where a real uh, advocate team or a champion team kind of has its, its strength is when it's when it's mm -hmm. empowered. So there's an example you mentioned, Teresa, she's making yeah. a suggestion. She's one of the advocates. She made a suggestion about the Time to Talk program. Now I know a little bit about the program. That's now a, a company-wide initiative. Mm -hmm. Maybe tell us a little bit more about it because I, I think a lot, of, a lot of companies would have tried the, the virtual coffee shop, the virtual Zoom, the, even the, the, the virtual quiz there for a while. 
but a lot of them ran out of steam. But this, there's an awful yeah. lot more substance to the the time to talk um, mm -hmm. program. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, so time to talk, as Tony said, Teresa came up with that idea probably like last summer. Um, and then we set about kind of putting the wheels in motion and getting ready to launch that in October in line with World Mental Health Day. Um, and, you know, we arranged for our well-being advocates to attend a mental health advocate training session. So it was a two-hour session that was facilitated by CMIT um, and they completed a quiz after and then received a certificate after it, you know, certifying them as mental health advocates. Um, and then throughout the month, I suppose, we would have had people who came forward and shared their stories of difficulties that they may have had with mental health and also with other things. So like, you know, October was Breast Cancer Awareness Month mm -hmm. as well. So we had colleagues across the group who shared their stories. And again, you know, one of the things that we're always talking about and that Giles Barrett as our group wellbeing officer is always talking about is, you know, it's all about hearts and minds. So people connect with people. All of our staff connect with colleagues and their stories and the realities of maybe some of the struggles that they're facing. So in having staff members who are brave enough, I suppose, to share their stories and tell people about times, maybe when things weren't so great for them and they had to reach out to the likes of our employee assistance program for support and how they got through it. And um, that kind of encouraged people to share their own stories and yeah. kind of say that, okay, it's all right to actually hold my hand up and say, do you know what, I'm not okay at the moment and I need support. And I think in having that kind of group-wide focus on time to talk, it made people feel safe in having those conversations mm -hmm. with colleagues or with their advocates or with their people leaders. That sounds like that's exactly what you've been doing. It's 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 almost like a campaign to create a more psychologically safe yeah. work environment over time. It didn't happen overnight, but the more and more people you, you trained up, mm -hmm. uh, you, you even branded it. You've, you've got the, the logo, the hashtag mm -hmm. time to talk. You're just, you're just getting it out there. You're communicating about it. It's still happening regularly, the, the time to talk campaigns. And I think you mm -hmm. even have a like a, a virtual background that says time to talk. Mm -hmm. So just you're getting that message out there more and more and more. And unsurprisingly, people are being a little bit more encouraged to talk about their own stories. When you see, hear somebody else sharing, maybe you're more inclined to share. And it's just oh, over time, it's that, that, that trickle effect that, that can lead to that more psychologically safe work environment. Okay. And it's reminding people again that it is, it's an always on program. So, you know, that was something that we were very definite about when we launched it in October. This isn't something that we're just doing in October and we're going to forget about it in November. It's an always on campaign. And, you know, earlier in the year, in April, we teamed up and I'd mentioned or referred to it on the slide. We had teamed up with Crisis Support Line as one of their keyword partnerships to advertise the service that they provide. So that's a service that's available to everybody. So there's a there's a line that's accessible in the Republic of Ireland. There's one that's accessible in Northern Ireland and the UK. And there's one that's accessible in the States. It's not an AIB product, it's not an AIB offering, it's something that's accessible to any to everybody. But as in us signing up as a keyword partner, so using that T2T as a reference to yeah. our time to talk campaign, it was building awareness about it and letting colleagues across the group know about it as a resource that they could use if they wanted a text option to talk to somebody, but also that they could tell their family members, their friends, you know, anybody that they felt might actually need it and might prefer to use that text option to yeah. talk to somebody. Um, and yeah. like, I think one of the things that I was really surprised about when we spoke, you know, when we started those conversations with the team at 50808 was, you know, the reasons why somebody might use it. I had kind of really assumed that it was a, gen a generational thing, you know, that young people might prefer but actually some of the scenarios they talk through where, you know, you're living in a house share and there actually isn't a space for you to have a private conversation with somebody. So it's much easier to have a text conversation mm -hmm. or, you know, everybody's working from home at the moment. So like the whole family is there and nobody actually has that quiet space to have a conversation. So using that text option is so much easier. And um, so like we were delighted to be able to do that again, as part of that Time to Talk programme, but also to bring awareness to yeah. a resource that's available to everybody. 
it's, yeah, it's, exactly. it's so important. I mean, the amount of companies I know that have really good programs or initiatives in place, but half the employee population don't even know those programs exist. Mm -hmm. The importance of communicating strategically about them is often overlooked. And you know, the yeah. branding that goes with that and the, the repeat messaging is, is so important. So it sounds like you've, you've, you've done a really good job there. Yeah, um, and one of the things, Brian, that we've actually done as well is is that each of our exco members, so our senior executives, um, they will sponsor elements um, or streams within our wellbeing program. So our CFO is the um, is the sponsor of uh, our our um, mental health uh, element of it, and he's one hundred percent behind this and would be very much involved in in promoting it right across the organisation. So we're we're very lucky to have that senior leadership buy-in and I think that is one of the things that for anybody who's starting um, or thinking of starting a, a well-being program uh, unless you have that senior leader buy-in and their 100% support you'll find it very difficult to actually um, make it a success because they need to believe in it as much as the people um, as, as much as the advocates for example. Absolutely and that was, that was a question we had actually as well about senior leadership support and, and how you go about that so you're having that in place is, is so important. Yeah. You touched on another really important point there as well um, when you're talking about the, the Time to Talk campaign is that wasn't just a campaign for October. No. That was an ongoing campaign. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. almost an issue I have. Like I'm a big fan of, you know, mental health first aid. It's, it's a wonderful program, but I see far too many organizations, they, they sign up, a few colleagues sign up, and then they're expecting, well, that's it. That's our mental health uh, program taken care of. Mm -hmm. But there's no plan in place for those first aiders. There's no support in place for them after the training. It's just, and you, you check back in a year later, two years later, and there's, there's no kind of support or no program in place. But you, you certainly have that foundation there that that's, that's ongoing today. Exactly. And we have to move that, you know, you mentioned our virtual wellbeing festival. Um, so, yeah. you know, as part of that, we had included, again, based on feedback from colleagues earlier in the year when we were talking. So I would deliver time to talk masterclasses for colleagues across the group. And one of the things that we talk about or that we highlight is kind of some of the symptoms of panic attacks, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression. Yeah. And it, Coming out of that, I had a couple of staff members who attended those sessions come to me and either send me a mail or pick up the phone to me and say, do you realise actually that some of those symptoms that you're talking about are the symptoms of menopause or perimenopause as well? So that kind of got me thinking, did a bit of research and discovered, yes, absolutely it is, you know, that it can be something that really is a huge issue for women and for their family and friends because of the impact that it has on relationships, you know. Um, so as part then of our Everybody Fest, we made sure to include a couple of sessions like panel discussions with menopause experts. Mm -hmm. And we sort of branded that as it's time to talk about menopause mm -hmm. because it isn't just about sort of the mental health. It's, it's time to talk, I suppose, about any issues or any things that there's a stigma attached to that people don't feel comfortable in talking about so again it's that kind of evolution I suppose of the time to talk program and you know those two menopause sessions that we had were hugely you know well received like the, the feedback and the comments that we had from colleagues across the group about them now feeling more comfortable in starting a conversation with their colleagues and instead of it being oh it's you know women of a certain age you know, and you can't mention it, actually, some of the things that we found out is, you know, perimenopause, you can start the symptoms of that, like, in your mid to late, or mid to late 30s, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of women don't actually realise that. So, again, as you mentioned, Brian, it's about that kind of psychological safety, yeah. and letting people know that, yes, we're having the conversation on a group-wide level, so that nearly enables you or encourages you to continue those conversations locally yourselves. Excellent. I think one, one of the sorry, Brian. I think one of the things that you said there is just around, you know, the, the continual education of 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 the the, the advocates and, yeah. you know, well, we we did we did our our um, time to talk training and, you know, on a we, we meet with our advocates on a monthly basis um, and uh, now at the minute it's very much catch up and uh, letting them know what's happening and just various discussions with regard to how things are going within their local areas um, and. Uh, what we're hoping to do is is when we 
are able to come back together again um, because that was one of the things we were extremely lucky with was that we had started to build that community um, as part of the training of our advocates uh, before COVID and that community as I said that, that that community and their ability to gel together and work together during COVID uh, was phenomenal um, and now we're re-looking with regard to what it is we need to do in order to further educate the, um, the, the well-being advocates um, and it will, uh, uh, we're looking at designing a program at the minute that will that will help with that and it's it's really around you know how can they um, look at at uh, well-being within their own area how can they they promote well-being within their own area and it'll also be a, probably an enhancement as well to the time to talk uh, initiative um, right. and maybe looking at, at, at any more type of enhanced training that we can do with regard to that um, and making sure that they don't feel o un overwhelmed as well with regard to what we're asking them to do. And that, that's a question actually that's just come in there is what are, what's the meeting frequency or communication strategy for, for the advocates, for the steer, for the uh, council, and, and the training then, what kind of training is provided? Um, I think you kind of touched on it, there's a new yeah. program coming. So if, if we take it maybe from the, the, the top down, so the council meets once a month okay. um, and we have a very defined um, agenda that we, we get through. Um, we uh, meet with the advocates once a month as well. So prior to, to COVID, we were able to, to do that uh, in person, which was brilliant. Um, and following COVID, as was we had to, or during COVID, we had to adapt really quickly because we were so dependent on this group of people with regard to promoting well-being within their within their areas and promoting for example, as Suzanne mentioned, our um, EAP or our workplace options, people knowing what options are available to them, people feel, feeling comfortable to say, you know what, I don't feel okay today. Um, so we met, we, we meet with our advocates on a monthly basis as well. Um, and as I said, in, initially in the, the kind of kickoff um, after COVID, it was very much kind of training and uh, kind of talking about um, ex um what people are experiencing and maybe issues that people were experiencing and looking at kind of finding the resources to be able to support our advocates uh, in that. Um, uh, uh, we are going to actually kind of, Suzanne will touch on the Everybody Fest, which was a massive initiative um, over the past month. And we're actually going to just kind of take some time over July and August to kind of reassess, look at what has worked well during um, the first half of the year, learn from that. And then in September, when everybody is coming back and we're about to hit the ground running again, we will be looking and we will have a plan, not only a plan of, of kind of themed initiatives, but also a plan with regards to training and our engagement with, with our advocates. So we will be looking at um, probably enhanced mental health training. Uh, we will also be looking at one of the things that we're very conscious of over the last while is we have asked a horrendous, sorry, horrendous, an awful lot, of, an awful lot of our advocates in the last fifteen months, and we need them now to start thinking about themselves as well. So one of the areas that we're looking at for themselves, and we mentioned kind of the psychological safety element, but also psychologically looking after themselves as well. Um, and this this was something that we want to give back to the yeah. advocates as a thank you for the wonderful work that they've done um, over. The the last 15 months. Fantastic, yeah, um, that, make, that makes so much sense. And the, I used a case study in the Wellbeing Champion training program. It's from a university in the US who has have a large training pro, uh, Wellbeing Champion training program. But as part of that, now I guess they do have a, you know, a decent enough budget, but they have um, almost as a thank you, almost as part of your, your annual agreement to become a Wellbeing Champion is there's a two day program. It's like a fit for life program or something, but it's physical well-being, mental well-being and social well-being. So that's as, as part of your, your training, if you like, but uh, really your self-care as well yeah. for, for the champions or for the advocates that that's included in the program. So if there's anything yeah, an organization can do to kind of give back to their, to their advocates, then I absolutely 100% recommend that. I think one of the things as well is is that you know uh, kind of your well-being isn't just about your mental and your physical well-being. I mean, Suzanne spoke about financial well-being, but it's also your career well-being as well, and yeah. it's the opportunity to learn and grow. Um, and you know, by by providing this this training to um, or any type of training that helps people with regards to developing themselves and be becoming kind of their true self in some ways mm -hmm. as well. Um, and you know, kind of. 
I, I feel myself that this is a, a great way for people to, to um, kind of focus on themselves as well as everybody else. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it makes so much sense. Um, focus on, on self-care and then, and then that's going to that's gonna trickle down to your colleagues, to your clients. That's kind of the approach I certainly take with the, with yeah. the community. Questions coming in again, and people looking for some more examples of initiatives that you've run and how the wellbeing advocates supported those initiatives. We spoke about time to talk and you, you touched on Everybody Fest. Maybe tell us a bit more about Everybody Fest because that's pretty much just wrapped up in the last, um, uh, last week or so. Yeah, this we missed. Sorry, sorry, Suzanne. This is very much Suzanne's baby, and she played uh -huh. a blinder here. So it's just, it's fair play to her. She was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so Everybody Fest finished on Friday, um, having run for a month, so it kicked off the Tuesday after the June Bank Holiday weekend. And again, this was something that came out at the start of the year from a conversation like with some of the wellbeing advocates. Wouldn't it be great if we could do a virtual wellbeing festival? You know, because we were all very conscious, I suppose, of the fact that we were still in lockdown. Um, you know, we didn't really know when we were going to be able to get back into a room together. Plus the fact that we, you know, We've got such a, a spread out workforce, you know, as we mentioned, we have the Re Republic of Ireland, we have Northern Ireland, we have the UK and we have New York as well. So in fairness, COVID has probably given us a massive opportunity in allowing us to engage with people across all of those areas that we probably never would have before. You know, we don't think we would have done everybody fest had COVID not happened. I don't think we would have thought that we could do something virtually that would hit everybody, I suppose, across the group. And um, so, you know, that started off, that was a conversation in January. Let's have a think about it. Let's see what we can do. And um, again, utilizing sort of the resources that we've got already. So, you know, um, making sure we wanted Everybody Fest, I suppose, to be an opportunity to showcase all of the resources that we've got yeah. for colleagues across the group. And um, so, you know, utilizing the employee assistance program and workplace options and the resources that are available there utilizing our partnerships with pep talk and with gym pass and again taking an opportunity to highlight and showcase their offerings and what it is that people can get out of those um, and as we mentioned we'd over 80 events over the course of the month and um, the majority of events were recorded so that they were available for people to catch on playback mm -hmm. if they weren't able to catch them live. They all took place virtually via Zoom and um, we covered off topics. So basically we had five pillars, if you like, within the virtual wellbeing um, festival and we covered off mental, physical, financial um, connection and then diversity and inclusion in all of those tents, if you like. Mm -hmm. And we so we touched off topics I've already mentioned menopause you know we had time to talk master classes we are very lucky within AIB that we have you know a number of sports ambassadors so colleagues who have played intercounty GAA rugby that sort of stuff and they were able to kind of join panel discussions if you like to share some of the skills I suppose that they use in their sporting life and how they translate to business and that sort of stuff and um, we had you know a session from Mercer who are our pension provider we had a session with Utmost who are the company who look after income protection for staff so again it was very much about utilizing what we've already got within the organization and making sure that actually colleagues across the group were aware of it. Brilliant. Yeah, and I like that idea of you know whatever it is you're doing, you're kind of you're promoting what you already have as well. Yeah. Reference if it's a mental health resilience talk. You know, oh, by the way, remember our, our EAP program or mm -hmm. whatever it is. You're kind of supporting, promoting the tools that are, you already have in place and communicating a little bit more about them. Yeah, and it's very much about sort of joining the dots. Like that's yeah. what we're always talking about. Like you know, so like. <clears throat> obviously within the HR function we have a team who look after our pensions we have a team who look after our employee assistance program and it's making sure that we're giving a consistent message to colleagues across the group so that they realize what actually is on offer to them and yeah. what resources are available to them 
Brilliant, yeah. I'm conscious of time here. I wonder, we've got a good few questions coming in, so I want, we might try a few quick fire, a quick fire round or something like that, see if that works. Yeah. Your well-being budget question is coming up a few uh. times there. Well, uh, people ask me, well, well, the budget, tell us about the budget, the budget, the budget, the budget. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I suppose the budget, yeah, it, it, this, is, this is always a question that, that, that's asked. And one of the things is, okay, look, you know, we, we work in a big organization and there, there is a central budget. Um, but what I would say is, is a lot of the things that we do, we actually um, use our own internal resources for as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we look, up, look at it, if you have somebody in your organization who, for example, is is a yoga instructor or, you know, who likes to run. Um, you know, we, 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 this is how we started off. We, we yeah. used our own internal resources. And, you know, Suzanne mentioned our well-being officer, Giles Barrett. He is very much about using what you have internally because they're the best ambassadors that you're going to get. So the example that I used earlier on with regard to um, the jump, jump into Jan, you know, that, that was somebody who's interested in nutrition and who's interested in physical exercise who's willing to share um, and that that is where we've created the community um, so you know while while we will have something centrally um, we're always extremely conscious with regard to getting the best value for our money and making sure that we are um, we're not just running initiatives because they're the, the right thing to do we're very much about running initiatives that will reach as many people um, as we possibly can and not being very specific for one group or another. And that's one of the things actually, Tony, as well, with regards to, you know, the plan for Jan, as you mentioned, Linda Redmond, who's one of our advocates down in the southeast. Mm -hmm. That was something that she would have run in the past locally for the branches mm -hmm. that were based in Wicklow, Wexford, Carlow, yeah. which was her local market, if you like. Mm -hmm. So we were then able to bring that to life I suppose for all of our advocates yeah. and cascade it on a group wide level so it wasn't just something that those three counties were able to do but we were able to cascade it via all of our advocates and everybody then could avail of it and that's what you know I spoke to earlier is that mm -hmm. kind of that consistency so that everybody is having an opportunity to participate and nobody feels like they're being left out they exactly. all have opportunity to take part instead of people looking going, oh Jesus aren't they great down in Wexford they do loads but actually we don't do anything yeah. so it's you know having the group well-being program in place has has enabled us or allowed us to do that yeah and like even on that I know we'll say talking about the plan for Jan like the the, the uh, one of the advocates in my own area Sinead like she would have taken that and she would have driven that within customer services and we got and got a huge amount of, of um, interaction and a huge amount of participation um, which was great and th this is one thing kind of an issue like this bring is again this connectivity um, and that feeling of togetherness which in some ways we're missing out a little bit because we're a lot of people are working from home very good yeah um I, so, the, so that's i think the, the plan for jan is a good example of how mm -hmm. you can utilize yeah. your existing resources to, to drive what you're doing then that comes to the next question that's probably next most popular is what about the time commitment then let's say for the advocates or uh, the well-being council members then how, how does that work is it is it formal time i know you touched on the objective actually which is which mm -hmm. is interesting you know, that's that might be something new you, you might you might touch on that again yeah so um the the council part of it is it, it is very much um voluntary mm -hmm. um there wouldn't really be anything official with regards to it so it, it is utilizing a lot of your own time and this is where i suppose again it's it's a, a community of like-minded people who really want to help drive um, uh, well-being across the organization. Um, when it comes to time for the advocates, um, it's very difficult to actually put a time on it because it will all depend on what we're actually asking them to do. So the, for the majority of the time, it's very much promoting central um, central initiatives. It's uh, talking about well-being. It's making sure that people are aware of what's available to them. Um, and it's also watching for the signs that it, maybe if somebody isn't feeling great, you know, you know, the, the whole thing, if you're on a lot of, of Teams calls and all of a sudden somebody 
somebody doesn't have their camera on who always would have it's remembering that and, and thinking about that so the but there could be other times just like when we had our, our well-being festival um you know we could be asking them for maybe three four hours um over the month um and again it's because again we've got lots of senior leadership buy-in um we can we can ask for that time now it's not easy don't get me wrong yep. i mean it's not easy like our priorities are very much around delivering to our customer and we have to make sure that we continue to do that mm -hmm. um but it's really about finding the right balance and, and all the research says that as well as the champion or advocate volunteering their time whether it's three or four hours a month Equally as important as that is that they have support from their line manager yeah. to mm -hmm. do that as well. So they should be equally as involved in the process and the approvals and, and all of that that side of things for this to be successful. Yeah, and as well, Brian. I suppose like you know the wellbeing council is made up of senior staff members, you know, within the organisation. So like they're all kind of people leaders. They're responsible for teams within their own areas mm -hmm. and they very much understand the impact that yeah. well-being can have on performance. Mm -hmm. So actually, by them dedicating time to well-being, that's helping their team's performance. And do you know what I mean? Helping yeah. with employee Absolutely. engagement. Yeah. Again, it's also so important to make sure that people join those dots. That's yeah. And I think I think up, you know, a lot of the time people see well being as a nice to have. Mm -hmm. Um and I think research is, is showing us over the last, you know, last while that it's no longer a nice to have, it's a have to have. Yeah. Um and you know, research the likes of, of Gallup and Deloitte, they're they're doing a huge amount of research in, in this area at the minute. And what they're doing is they're seeing the linkage between um well being, between purpose um, between engagement and in turn the bottom line Absolutely. Um, yeah and I think I think that's for us this is a really really important message as well because I think you know a lot of sometimes um, there can be slight blockers with regard to promotion of well-being because they only see it as a fluffy thing yeah. um, when you can actually link it to uh, improved engagement and improved engagement uh, it, is sorry, it is proven that improved engagement leads to um, an improved bottom line um, and I think when you, as Suzanne says when you can join all of those dots it, it, and you can see how, what an impact it has from a strategic perspective to the organisation then that's when you get a lot more buy-in and that, that is that's one of the questions we have actually it's how do you do that then? How do you, how would they be? How is the well-being program linked to the strategy, to the overall organizational strategy? And and are you measuring? Are you able to measure what you're doing from a well-being perspective to you know show to the leadership team? Look, here's how we impacted the bottom line, for example. Yeah, and, and that that is that is the the, the difficulty. So the bottom line is the difficulty because again, it, it these aren't tangible things that you can actually look at. So what we're doing is we do regular check-in surveys. Um, so if we look at it, um, the. Uh, think it might have been in April 2020, um, the, our survey would have said that 59% of people felt that, um, that AIB wouldn't have been looking after their well-being, whereas our recent survey in May of this year said that 80% 80, 80 of people that responded said that AIB were looking after their, their, their or were, were they, they were, I can't remember the exact wording of it, but it was that they were interested in their well-being and they were putting supports in place. Um, but that, I mean, that's a massive, massive jump yeah. Um, particularly in a virtual environment and also in a, in a, the situation that we're all finding ourselves in in a, in a pandemic and it's that type of, of um, it's that type of survey that that we feed up into a senior leadership perspective because you know the, the, the stats are there and the, the, the data is there to prove that um, the other area we would look at is very much around participation yeah um, and looking at the numbers for for various different things um, and uh, that, that tells us two things it tells us about engagement but it also tells us if we're hitting the mark and have we are people interested in what we're putting on um, and uh, that helps us then plan for the future as well and I think a final question then you've been really generous with your time the the objectives you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. is that like an annual uh, objective yeah. for well-being mm -hmm. advocates so it's almost yeah. like they're, they're KPIs if you like so they now yeah. have a well-being there's a, a target if you like from a well-being perspective is that right? So there isn't an actual target. Okay. So what, what we're asking, again, this is, uh, 
the overall wellbeing group has just been in place since 2018. I'm right, I always get this wrong, Suzanne. Um, so, you know, the Giles was appointed group wellbeing officer in April 2019, but yeah, at that stage, it was only himself and one yeah, other person. Yeah. Um, and then the wider team, I suppose, came into being yeah. in June last year. Yeah, so it was. It, it's only since then that we've actually started to look at this with regards to the kind of return on investment with regards to targets. Um, so we don't do individual targets. Um, so uh, what it's very much around is is, is proof of um, engagement with with well being activities. It's proof of promotion. Um, it's coming up with ideas at a local level, mm -hmm. um, and th they will evolve over time yes, as we. Yes. Become, as we become more, um, as well-being becomes more embedded uh, in everything that we do. Well, I think that's a real positive step. Um, I know there's companies in the US that are doing this, where, where well-being is, is an objective on the, the annual KPIs, if you like, and it's different forms, different shapes. It's, again, it's not perfect yet, but having it in there in some shape or form for, mm -hmm. for everyone, for line managers, I think it's, it's a key kind of metric we can, we can work towards. Yeah. So I think it's a definite positive step. So well, well done to AIB for including that. Thanks. Guys, do you have any final final words, final thoughts you'd like to get across? I, I just got I wanted I've got one slide I want to share at the end, but have you guys got any kind of final thoughts, final comments um for the audience today? I just see one question that has just yeah. come in with regards to time to talk and how it takes place on a sort of a basic level and I suppose like just to give an idea so again we would encourage advocates when they're organising events locally to promote it under the time to talk banner so if it's a coffee morning and they're encouraging people like just to kind of meet up and have a chat that they're promoting it as a time to talk event and um, during everybody fest what we did was we arranged connect cafes and um, so where staff are in branches you know and physically in the same location as each other they were having their coffee break say on a friday morning but then for other areas we had arranged meetings via teams and then using breakout rooms within those so that you could put people into groups of say five or six to actually just have a social chat in some instances we gave them topics that they could potentially discuss it could be the Euros, it could be you know, what you're watching on Netflix at the moment. Um, one really good one that we had was what was the most random online purchase during lockdown that generated a really I interesting go right away now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, did, we did outdoor dining. Uh, so uh, Sinead and Rachel and, and, and my team, they, they sourced outdoor dining and activities. It was probably a short enough conversation, I'd say, was it? <laughs> No, in fairness, it wasn't. No. Lots, lots of places. <laughs> but like, so that's the kind of things that we're talking about. We're not reinvent. Like a lot of the stuff that we do yeah. is really, really simple. It's using the resources that we have. It's not going out and spending a huge amount of money on stuff. But again, it's just encouraging that engagement and that connection. And um, we recently have just started using MS Teams within AIB, and I know one of the teams, one of our advocates, was telling us like that they had a team coffee morning, and there's a whiteboard functionality within MS Teams. So they had started using that. And they were having a game of Hangman. So that, again, they had breakout rooms, and they were doing like Hangman and Pictionary, where you had to draw the stuff on your screen so again it's just kind of trying to flip things on its head i suppose and think about doing things in a different way and, and repeating that message again and getting to know people through the the virtual mm -hmm. cafes if you like you get to know maybe a time to talk ambassador uh, mm -hmm. you might not have the conversation with them then but when their time comes up where you may, maybe you need to speak to somebody you, you know that person now you've got a connection with them so it just makes it just a little bit easier to have that conversation I was going to share one slide. Tony, by the way, Tony, do you have anything to say there? Anything to finish up no, with? I suppose just, just one thing, um, and it's really that this is a journey. You know, give yourself time. If you are starting, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and uh, don't be too hard on yourselves because um, it's, it, it, can be, it can be tough, but once you crack it, it's brilliant. Brilliant. And I was going to ask a final, final question. Advice for a company, maybe take yourself out of AIB, the larger organization for a while, maybe a smaller organization looking to get started. Any kind of advice there? And it's just trying to create that shared ownership for well-being. Yeah. Any thoughts? Find a sponsor. And Find I don't mean I don't mean a sponsor as in a, a money sponsor. Yeah, I mean I mean a sponsor leader. within the organization at a senior level who will definitely um, promote well-being with you. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great advice. 
Um, I'm just going to share one slide, um, if I may, just I, I touched on at the beginning, just the well-being champion train for anyone that is interested in, in now this is this won't get you to the finish line. This will get you to the start line if you're interested in developing, creating a program, or maybe it's refreshing a program as well. And, and I do it live. I do, I have got, I use Zoom. I've got the, I think Zoom, the um, the whiteboard and Zoom is an awful lot. I use more user-friendly than the one on Teams. I've tried it on Teams and it, it was a little bit of a disaster. I won't go into detail on that one. But Zoom is really good for interaction, for workshops, for the for the uh, breakout rooms, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very easy to just spell out what's included in the four sessions. But here, I think the easiest way to do it and the feedback, the, the positive feedback mm -hmm. I get on the sessions is the outputs. What are the, what are some tangible outputs we, we would actually get from this training? And here it is. And we've touched on this in the session. First session, we look at how can you align what you're doing from a well-being perspective with the organization's vision? So can you demonstrate to the senior leadership team that by you know, working towards well-being here, that working towards our well-being vision, we're actually working towards the organization's vision. So the well-being stuff we're doing here is actually supporting us at an organizational level and the bottom line ultimately. So that's one of the things we look at. We get a draft well-being vision statement um, out of that session. I think it's really important to look at what are the roles and responsibilities of a well-being champion or advocate in our organizations. And what's really empowering is can you encourage the champions themselves, the advocates, to input into that process and to actually help define the role and responsibility? How empowering is that if they can have a say in that? So that's something we look at. And also nobody knows the challenges and the barriers of getting well-being running uh, initiatives running in your organization better than your own, your own teams. So we look at that. We've also got a really nice kind of, you know, one year. What, what does the future look like? How will we plan ahead? Do a nice uh, one year in the future exercise as well. There's some of the key kind of tangible outputs you'll get from the program. Go to um, workwellinstitute.org to find out more or, or drop me an email at any stage. But guys, listen, Tony, Suzanne, you've been unbelievably generous with your time. We could have, we could have gone on for a couple of hours there, I'd say, with the amount of questions that are coming in. I'll try and answer a few more of them that, that I see popping in. Well, listen, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Great to get such a good overview of, of the great work you're doing in there. So listen, keep up the great work and thanks so much for your time. Thanks a million, Brian. Take care. Thanks. Enjoy the summer. Thanks, guys. Yeah, have a great summer. Take care, everybody. Bye.